Hi there, this is Carl Irwin with another tutorial. This is going to be uh, a second uh, music tutorial, a follow-up on the creation of a theme. Uh, this is um, having to do with our series. It's ongoing related to uh, uh, creating music, writing a film score to your own animation, and we're making an animation uh, simultaneously in Blender uh, using the OpenGL uh, viewport capabilities to render out a, a space scene sort of sequence with a number of different uh, visuals, uh, some abstract uh, sort of uh, images uh, based on space, uh, galaxies, nebula, star fields, things like that, of that nature, uh, and then writing some music to go along with that. Um, this is the second tutorial that is going to deal with music. Uh, apart from the uh, introduction and then the first tutorial where we wrote a theme, uh, we're going to take this theme that we wrote here uh, that we'll listen to a minute in a minute here, and we're going to take that theme and we're going to uh, flesh it out and render it out uh, in, a, in an orchestration, and we're going to talk about how to do that. Um, a few things, first of all, is that we're not yet dealing with a film. We don't have a completed film yet. All we do is we have a concept. We've seen some visuals. We know essentially what the film is going to look like. Uh, and from that we've come up with some ideas related to uh, thematic writing. And that's what we did in the last uh, tutorial. Today we're going to look at what to do with this theme. Uh, in particular, we're not really going to work on any other ideas apart from this theme. We're still just going to work on this one idea. Um, but other things, just before we continue on with this, um, other things that we're going to be doing in the future, we're going to be coming up uh, with some other underscoring ideas, uh, writing ostinato patterns, other motivic sorts of uh, uh, concepts and, and figures, uh, pitch collections, and some other interesting orchestration using maybe some synthesizers uh, and some some other kinds of uh, soundscape sorts of sounds uh, to uh, fill out our film score. But right now we're looking at thematic writing. Um, all you need uh, to move forward is the melody and the harmonic progression, and we have that right here. So let's take a quick listen to remind ourselves uh, of what we wrote. Okay, so uh, just a quick reminder, what we talked about in the last tutorial was the idea of using leading tones, chromatic leading tones, and there are two places in the major scale where we see chromatic leading tones, uh, as sort of a, a driving force, uh, an emotive sort of force in our theme, and we decided to use uh, both of these instances of chromatic leading tones uh, uh, together, back to back here in the formation of our melody. Uh, so we see the one where we're going from the seventh uh, seventh scale degree to the first scale degree leading up to uh, the tonic note and then the other one is uh, going from the fourth scale degree down to the third scale degree uh, heading back down the scale down to the third uh, from the tonic the major third uh, and we are uh, employing these two uh, leading tone um, attributes of the major scale in order to give a, a sense of uh, persistent tension and release, tension and release, tension and release as, what it, as we come across these two intervals. Um, underneath that we composed a very simple uh, chord progression very major chord progression. There's no chromatic variations in there. We're just using very basic uh, 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 harmonic functions here. Uh, depending mostly on the uh, one chord, uh, the four chord, the five chord, a little bit on the uh, three chord and a six chord in there as well. Uh, so that is uh, what we have in a nutshell, uh, is our, our thematic progression and our, our, our thematic melody. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about last time in the last tutorial is what we want to do with this information. We want to export this as MIDI data, and the reason why we want to do that is because MIDI data can be very useful uh, across projects, because uh, you might you make different sequences that you will then mix together for your final score, and you want to be able to use that uh, MIDI data in various projects. You also want to be able to use it potentially, uh, although we're not going to get into that, but you might want to use it potentially in another platform. Uh, 
so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as well, that you might want to use this to create some uh, um, notation that other instrumentalists would be using. Um, the goal right now is going to be to assign instrumentation to these parts. So if we uh, export this out as MIDI data, the way to do that from LMMS is to go to a File, Save, uh, no, Export MIDI down here. We want to hit Export MIDI, and then we can uh, give it a, a title, and we can export that MIDI data. I've already done it, and I've saved it to the desktop, uh, and then that MIDI data can be used in another project. So let's just quickly hit Save on this one. Uh, in fact, I want to show you very quickly a way that that can be used in notation software. If we just close out of this, I have a Muse score uh, right here, and uh, I'm going to open up an instance of MuseScore. This is running off of the app image uh, version, which I find I have found to be a little bit more stable than the current release for um, this uh, version of Linux Ubuntu. Uh, we're going to close that, and if we go up to File and we hit uh, Open, and we go to the desktop and we hit uh, theme 1 MIDI and you can actually see it'll show you a little bit of a, uh, a preview of what that will look like and we hit open you'll see it loads in pretty well and uh, we can play this back right away that should sound very familiar so from here we could add instrumentation and score this out and use uh, this data, these, this notation, uh, to flesh out our orchestration. Uh, but we're not going to do that right now because we're not creating this for performers. We're creating this uh, strictly in a virtual orchestra. So we'll close out of MuseScore and we'll go back to uh, LMMS and open up another instance of this. Now I've talked before in previous tutorials about uh, the importance of making a template and we actually have an orchestral template that I've already made. If I come up here to file a new from template, uh, I've made a symphonic template. I'm going to load that in. This is actually the template that I created the theme in on the piano track. Uh, it will load everything in and I have full instrumentation and basic um, sound fonts, just a basic general sectional sound font for each one of the instruments in the uh, orchestra and uh, these are assigned to various uh, effects mixer channels uh, and these channels then have uh, additional effects on them so each channel has a reverb effect that places those instruments within that channel in a particular space in the ensemble and then we have also so on the master output uh, finish reverb uh, as well as a compressor some equalization and then a stereo enhancing effect uh, to just give us the right uh, tone uh, and of course these can be edited and changed as we create our project um, what I'm going to do is import our MIDI data that we can then use inside of this project and uh, copy that data over to other instruments so the way we're going to do that is we're going to go to file import uh, import and then we're going to go to the desktop where we have our MIDI and we'll open that up and automatically it's going to put it into a piano um, track down here. Uh, what I can do is I can either leave that down there uh, or I can uh, put this MIDI data into other places. So for example uh, let's say we wanted to uh, use the MIDI data to generate a solo instrument and some piano accompaniment. Uh, I might uh, right click on this and hit copy and then I'll come up to piano. I'll click uh, a new entry section there. I'll right click and I'll hit paste. Uh, down here I'm going to disable this track so we don't hear it play back. And then uh, let's say we have an oboe solo. I'm going to click another uh, open spot up here and right button click and hit paste again. So I have two instances of this, one for the oboe, one for the piano. Now if I double click into the piano one, uh, what I can do is I can delete my uh, solo, my melody, up here by using the box selection tool and then I can just use my shortcut uh, delete key on my keypad and we're just gonna parse this down to what we need so we just have the piano accompaniment and then uh, alternatively up here in the oboe part we're going to select the accompaniment track and hit delete so now what I'm left with 
is the melody in the oboe and then just the chords in the piano. And if I play this back, we get something uh, that would sound like this. So this is the essence of orchestration. We've already started to orchestrate our project. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the concepts that are important here. Again, all you need is the melody and the harmonic progression. That's all you really need in terms of input data, and we have that in our MIDI file down here. Um, the goal then is to assign uh, the data to various instrumentation parts in order to come up with uh, an orchestration. Uh, we want to think about it like this. We're going to be working outward from the concept, uh, from this concept that we created in the MIDI data, the uh, accompaniment chords and the melody, and we're going to be working in two directions. Uh, first of all, we're going to be uh, maybe reducing this down to more basic elements, uh, such as we what we did up here in the oboe part, we just took the melody out and just assigned it to that one instrument. Um, alternatively, we would be augmenting it, and we might be taking uh, these various parts and uh, changing them in some way, either writing counter melody uh, uh, ideas, so additional melodies that go against the original melody but still within the bounds of the chord progression, or we might be substituting some things. We might be substituting certain notes or durations or substituting chords uh, and augmenting the idea. So one direction we're working is we're reducing the idea to more basic elements, in the other direction, we are augmenting uh, the fundamental ideas into more exotic sorts of uh, renditions. So working outward from our uh, original concept is really what we're doing. And it all begins with the concept. It all starts there and goes in, in two directions, either forward or, or in more, more in a reductive uh, kind of situation. Um, we want to also think about presenting our material with modulation, that is to change the key to go to another place. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment here uh, when we get into it. Uh, so we might uh, render this out with some sort of orchestration, but then change key and give a variation, another instance of the same idea, but in a different key uh, to give kind of a motion forward that we're going from one kind of tonal center to another universe, another tonal center. Um, and, you know, essentially that's what we're doing. We're building our orchestration or we're subtracting it down. We're doing one of those two things. We're building it up or we're reducing it down. Uh, in general, you want to be thinking about that concept in your orchestration in terms of where you're headed, where are you going. Are you starting, as we seem to be doing here, with a very small orchestration and then gradually building that up? Or do you want to start big and start to reduce that down, or a combination of the two at various points? You want to be thinking kind of in those broad general terms as you uh, go forward from there. Um, that's really all I have to say in terms of a setup uh, on this. Let's let's get into what some of the specifics, the specific ideas can be. Um, you want to be thinking about orchestration in two different ways, uh, and you can do either or both. Uh, you either want to orchestrate in families or you want to orchestrate with doublings across families. So families being you have the string family, the brass family, the woodwind family, the percussion family. Uh, this is for symphonic orchestration and also maybe voice, uh, which we're, we're not going to include here. We might include that later on in our project, but uh, today we're not going to deal with that. So orchestrating in families means that one family kind of covers all the various roles that you would need. There's a there's a variety of voice parts. There's a soprano voice, an alto voice, kind of a tenor baritone uh, uh, universe there, and an area for that voice part, and then a bass. And you have everything kind of covered, and all these roles are covered within the family. On the other side of it, if you're going to be orchestrating in doublings, that means that you would be using instruments from different families that are going together. Uh, and they are doubling together. Now you can do this one of two ways uh, in addition to that. You can uh, double either similar uh, voice parts that such that you'd be taking a soprano voice part like a, a trumpet and a violin and you'd be doubling those sections together 
or you can double contrasting voice parts such that you'd be taking like a clarinet and a trombone and doubling them together which could be very unusual um someone like bernard herman was was well known for doing that with with using very odd sorts of unconventional doublings to get a very unique sort of sound so uh i just want to remind you that there are no rules uh, there are no rules in music composition. There are rules in music emulation. If you're trying to write within a particular style of music and you're trying to emulate a specific style, then you have tendencies that you have to follow. You have to follow the rules to do that. Think of it like this. Let's you know say that it's Halloween and I'm going to go out, uh, I'm a kid, I'm going to go out trick-or-treating uh, and I want to dress up as a, a, a character from a horror movie like Halloween. Let's say I want to dress up like Michael Myers. Uh, and in order to dress up like Michael Myers, I, I would want to make sure that I don't wear a hockey mask because that's a totally different movie okay um, you want to you want to think about it in that way okay uh, so going forward here let's let's um, uh, our, talk about some of the, the the different techniques here we can use arpeggiation arpeggiation that is to take the uh, chord values and divide them up into individual notes that sound at different times. So let's try to do that very quickly. Let's jump into this piano part that we put down here and uh, we're going to uh, try some tricks here to try to keep this simple. Uh, we're going to select everything and uh, we're going to select our, our uh, edit tool and we're going to grab the last note and we're going to shrink it down to get to the 16th value. Now you can see that I have a 16th value over here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select uh, just these notes and, and, and shrink this down again. In fact, I may have gone too far. Let me open this up. So we're going to take this down to the 16th value. And if we come over here and we grab these last notes, so this is all proportional editing. And now we have 16th note values. Uh, now the next thing we want to do is we want to extend the possibilities for our arpeggiation. Right now we only have four notes. We usually are dealing with the root, the third, the fifth, and then the uh, root again in each one of these chord qualities. And some of them are inverted. Uh, let's select everything again. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. We'll box select everything again. I'm going to hit control C to copy and then I'm going to click uh, up here on the timeline in a space other than where uh, our notation starts and I'm going to uh, hit control V. Now what that does is it puts an instance of our notes in there in a different place. I'm going to move these uh, such that they are up the octave in a different place. So I'm going to grab this bottom note which is on the C and I'm going to move it up to the next available C. Uh, so right about here. I can see that things are a little bit off, so I'm going to change my note value to the highest one very quickly, uh, 1, 192, and then I can slide this over so that it all lines up. And then we'll go back to the uh, 16th note value in our quantization settings. Now what I can do is I've got two octaves. Actually, there's three octaves here because we have the root and then it starts over again. I have three octaves uh, to arpeggiate in. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move these notes around uh, such that I can get an arpeggiation uh, action going. Uh, one thing I might want to do is I might want to select all of these notes again and uh, change the value so that they ring a little bit longer. So I'll select everything and we'll stretch these out. Maybe we'll give it uh, one beat, one beat of length. And we'll select in an empty space. Let's move these around. So I'm going to take the first note and I'm going to move it over a sixteenth. I'm going to take the next mo note and move it over another sixteenth. And you can kind of see what's going on here. So these notes are going to descend in an arpeggiation. And once I get to the bottom, uh, I'm going to come back up again. So I'll put another instance of this note here. And I need to shorten this up because the next note has to start 
where the last 16th note left off. And then I'm back on track again. So I have, if you're counting, it's one E and a, two E and a, three E, and this would be on the and, this would be on the a, this would be on beat four, E, and then this would be on the and, and now I have this arpeggiated figure. If I go back and play it, and there's a little bit of sustain on there. So I could do that with each one of these measures, and it actually can be done a lot quicker than it may seem. Uh, but I just want to arpeggiate so I get a different kind of uh, character going on there. Let's do one more. Uh, so here we have beat one, E, and, uh. Now, you could play this in if you want. Uh, you could uh, just play this back in and uh, come up with another, uh, you know, another loop that you're creating. So you see what's going on if we play this back. Now if I finish this out, we can kind of hear what it sounds like, just the beginning part, with our oboe. And then I would want to change my uh, volume settings and, and set uh, the pan where I would want it to be and start mixing this together. I might even start changing my sounds at this point. Uh, but that would give me then uh, three total uh, instances of material. I would have my original with the chord progression and the melody. I would have an arpeggiated version and then I would have my melody. And from there I can start copying and pasting and using this material over and over again in various voice parts and start to build something up. So through the magic of TV editing, uh, let's open up a project that's already been completed and we'll break it down and talk about uh, what goes into it. So let me open up um, another version of this. And uh, this is following that exact principle that we talked about in terms of creating uh, different instances uh, in, in, of, of that material, arpeggiation. It also incorporates uh, some other ideas dealing with counter melodies uh, and also some uh, alternative bass lines and forcing particular bass lines. And we'll talk about how to do that in a moment. Uh, and then it also has a modulation in it where we're changing key. Uh, let me uh, just expand this out a little bit. Uh, and it has uh, some more complex uh, voices. So we've added some different um, types of instruments and duplications of instruments to get articulation in there. Let me play this and we'll uh, listen to it one time and then we'll go through piece by piece and talk about what's going on here.
Okay, so this is a, a very basic sketch of uh, uh, that theme uh, being fleshed out into some uh, wider instrumentation and orchestrated for us using all the uh, different families within the symphonic orchestra. Uh, we have some percussion writing down here and some interesting things we'll need to talk about. We have some string writing here, uh, some brass writing, and then some woodwind writing up here. And each section has some rules. There is a little bit of, of both types of orchestration. We have some family orchestration, but we also have some interesting doublings going on. Some of them might even be a little unconventional at moments. Um, so let's break this down. We'll talk about what's going on. So first of all, um, we use that idea that we were talking about uh, a moment ago where we have an arpeggiation going on, uh, and that is in the harp. So it starts out in the harp, and you can see if we open up that MIDI date, it looks very similar uh, to what we were talking about, and that's actually how this project started. Um, you can see that the velocity is set low, and I kind of put a curve on the velocity. So I'm starting to do some sequencing here where this, uh, as it descends, it gets softer, and then it gets louder as it uh, ascends again. And each instance gets a little bit louder as we go along to add a little bit of humanization to it. And then up here we have the oboe playing. Now I did change the tone a little bit. I changed the oboe sound to a, a different articulation. I put two oboe uh, tones together, balanced out together to make that sound more like an authentic uh, oboe instrument, a real live instrument, by using these two tones working together. Um, we can also see that the piano is going to come in here and use that arpeggiation as well. Uh, one idea I found with the arpeggiation, if we look, actually let's look at the different voice parts uh, one at a time. Let me solo the harp, the piano, and also there's a glockenspiel instrument out here, a, a mallet instrument. We'll just listen to this together and see what's going on. So here's that arpeggiation that we were talking about. I really didn't do anything different. It's exactly what we were discussing in the previous project. Now there's no automation. All of the volume change was accomplished with velocity only. Modulation, we'll talk about that in a minute. We've changed key. The glockenspiel is just playing the first four notes of that arpeggio. And a glissando in the harp. And that's the part. Uh, so a couple of unique things going on here. We have a glissando going on in the harp. I talked about the glockenspiel. The piano is playing fairly uh, straight up, just that arpeggi uh, arpeggiation. If we look at the second instance of the harp here and open that up, you'll see it looks kind of muddy. But what I did is I made a copy uh, of that arpeggio, and then I duplicated it. I moved it up one octave and slid it over in an eighth note value so that whatever it's doing down here, it's repeating one eighth note later up here. And I thought that made a very interesting sound. So this was just an experimentation that seemed to pay off. It sounds like this. There's kind of a really interesting morphing from one chord uh, quality into the next by half of a beat at the change of the measure. And I thought that sounded uh, really interesting and worked out well when we brought the strings in. So that's the uh, uh, keyboard and mallet instruments and a pretty basic writing there using that arpeggiation idea. Uh, over here is a, a written glissando. Uh, it's a diatonic glissando, meaning that it's within the key that we are at at the end here. Um, uh, chromatically, actually it's, I'm sorry, not not diatonic at all. It's a chromatic glissando, excuse me. Uh, and you can see that there is uh, a curve put on the velocity settings to make it sound a little bit more human. Uh, and also the note values are a little bit different. This is between the 32nd and uh, 16th note values. Uh, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. it. It changes sort of at will, just like a real person would play it. Uh, let's look at the string writing very quickly. So we have all these string instruments. We're going to uh, solo these so we can hear what's going on. Now I use um, 
particular sounds for very specific reasons, and it may only happen for one or two notes. So I'm using a slow string sounds for the violin entry, so it can kind of creep in. And then down here on this tone uh, down here, which is actually a solo violin, I add the second note, but not the first note. So this uh, sound comes in on a low velocity in the second note. And by the time we get to the uh, downbeat of the measure, the first measure, we're into the, the major uh, tone instrument right here. So we're, we're kind of morphing into this. And then down here, we have just one instance of each other uh, a voice part, a viola sound font, a celli sound font, and then a bass sound font. And then down here, when we have uh, marcato arpeggiations going on, we switch uh, articulations and sound font. Uh, to Marcato sounds so that it sounds a little bit more authentic. Let's see what this sounds like together. Okay, so uh, believe it or not, all we're using up to this point is just those two ideas. We have the melody up here in the violins. We have the chord progression from the original MIDI data down here divided up uh, among different voice parts. The bass line is the root notes and the basses, uh, and then we have uh, the root notes and then the uh, second uh, uh, voice from the bottom uh, in the celli, and then we have the two inner parts in the violas, and they're just separated out. Uh, you delete the parts you don't want, you keep the parts you do want, uh, and then uh, you divide out that, uh, that, that chord progression. So uh, we really haven't created anything new, we're just assigning parts up to this point. Over here we're just using the exact same arpeggiation that we created originally for the piano, uh, now in the uh, violins and the uh, violas and the celli. Uh, and the bass part does have some changes. Uh, we're going to try to force a, an alternative bass line in here. And you'll notice that the arpeggiation cuts out when we add some chromaticism to that bass line. We force this bass line. The idea here is that we're going to imply uh, a different uh, chord quality uh, without actually trying to sort out what that chord quality is. This is just a quick, cheap trick uh, in terms of uh, writing. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes you need to do a little bit more investigation to figure out what chords you're using. But uh, I'm just moving down by chromatic step, uh, first diatonically, uh, step by step, and then by chromatics, by half steps in the bass line. Uh, and what all I did is I cut out the arpeggiation on that half of a measure where that's happening so that uh, we'll have the bass line juxtaposed against whatever melody or counter melody is going on and we don't actually have to sort out what our chord progression is going to be we don't have to fill that out we just leave it blank in fact uh, by doing that you actually make it stand out a little bit more uh, it makes it a little bit more evident that you've changed something by doing that so just one little you know orchestration trick uh, thinning out the parts so that we can hear the one thing that's changing and that's it so um, now let's talk quick quickly about uh, changing key modulation is an important factor here we want to be able to modulate into a different key I just want to talk about different kinds of modulations briefly for a moment um, I talked a little bit last time about the most powerful chord progression that we have, uh, and that is the progression of the five chord to the one chord, a major five, either to a minor one or a major one. To major one is even more is much more strong than a minor one. Um, and uh, if you don't remember that conversation, go back to the last tutorial there, and you'll see that we had that. Uh, you can use that. Uh, basis that that truth to modulate to another key and it works something like this you can either use the one of the key that you're in it might be the last chord that you're playing in the theme uh, in the in the progression the one chord and use it as the five of the new chord 
so you turn or the new key so you turn that one into the five of the new key uh, it, 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 this is what we call a secondary dominant relationship that is where one chord that's preceding a new one that's tonicizing a new key or a different key other than the one that you were previously in uh, is is tonicizing that previous chord as if it's the five of the new key now going one to five is what we're going here uh, we're, we're making the one the five chord of the new key so we're going from C major major to F major, which is related uh, in that way. Five, uh, the five of F major is C major, and that is the one chord of this key. So by using that, uh, we can then get to F major. Now that is working around the key signatures uh, as they occur naturally. That is by adding one flat at a time. You have C major, then you add one flat, B flat, and you have F major. You add another flat, you would have B flat major. You add another flat, you have E flat major, and so on around. And then it can go the other direction in terms of sharps. Um, this is what we call the circle or cycle of fifths. Sometimes it's referred to as the circle of fourths, depending on how you're looking at it and which direction you're going. Uh, so we're using that to modulate to a new key, that basic idea. Now, you don't have to go uh, from the one chord as the five of the new key. You can actually turn any chord uh, through some kind of uh, modal substitution that is to change any chord quality within your progression into a major chord that can represent the five of the new key that you're tonicizing. So you can do that as well. Um, we might look at that in some other ideas later on. It gets a little bit more involved so we may not get there. Uh, we have a very short period of time uh, to uh, create our music for only a few minutes. We actually already are we already have a minute and a half here just in this one thematic idea. So um, secondary dominant modulation or tonicization, using one chord as the five of the new key that you're trying to uh, go to or tonicize momentarily. Um, so that is what's going on. Now one additional thing that we did here is that at the moment that we're switching, uh, I changed uh, one of the notes. If we go up here to the uh, violin part, I believe is where I did it. I added at the very end here a B flat. Now the B flat halfway through this last measure when we're on the one chord, which should be C E G, and I went from my C to a B flat just for that uh, half note value there, that turns it into a uh, seven chord. So it's a dominant seven chord. Uh, not seven is in the seventh scale degree, but seven is in it's using the seventh scale degree from the root of that chord. So uh, this would be uh, C, E, whoops, sorry, C, E natural, G natural, and then B flat. Um, there is only one progression that is stronger than 5 to 1, and that is a 5-7 to 1. That is a 5 chord that adds a, uh, a flat 7, flat 7th scale degree, uh, called a dominant 7. Uh, that is even stronger uh, going to a 1 chord than just the 5, major 5 alone. So I use this to better imply the fact or broadcast the fact that we're going to our new key by adding that 7th, a flat 7, uh, above the root. Okay, so uh, that's one alteration that I made there to help along our our um, change. So um, that's the string section. Let's look at the brass section, the family writing up here. So we'll solo our brass instruments. Again, so far, uh, all we've done is we've modulated. I've only used two ideas. We have the chords themselves. We have the melody as the second idea, and we have an arpeggiation. I haven't really written anything new. I've just assigned these ideas to various voices. And uh, here we go. This is the brass writing when they come in. Okay, and so much for using only a few ideas here. There's a quite a bit going on that we need to talk about. So first of all, the trumpet is handling the melody. So that's that's taken care of. The 
uh, tuba is handling the bass line with that chromatic adjustment that we've already talked about that we saw in the strings. So that's nothing really new. Uh, the trombone is handling a couple of different things. It's handling the bass line for one trombone part, doubling an octave higher from the tuba. But the trombone is also playing a counter melody along with the horns. So if we just look at the horns for a moment, we can see uh, what this counter melody is. Now, what I did is I played back my uh, theme a number of times and tried to imagine some other parts in there. And I kept hearing this. Uh, this is the, the same um, leading tone kind of motif uh, uh, happening one beat off or a beat late. Uh, and just using a few uh, pitches from the pitch collection, not the whole thing. And this is what it sounded like to me. In fact, let me enable the trumpet part down here so you can hear it against the uh, trumpet melody. So there's actually two trumpet parts. There's the melody, but then there's also a, a descant uh, solo part we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, so here's what I've got. The trumpet's the melody, the horn is the counter melody. So a couple things there. First of all, the horn part is holding on to a suspended note. It's kind of an accented passing tone. It is the first. Um, it's the first of the second set of leading tones. That would be what in the original key was the uh, F going to the E. Um, in this case, we're in a different key, uh, and it's holding it out longer than what it's supposed to be, and then resolving on the next beat in the next measure. So it's it's creating additional tension, uh, and then it starts over again. So that goes on like that, uh, and then at the very end, you'll hear one thing that's very interesting. There's a note that doesn't belong in the key at all. It's a, a sharp four or a flat five, uh, and this is called a Lydian uh, uh, relationship. So we're adding an additional uh, an additional leading tone by adding that sharp four. The note in the key should be uh, this note down here, which is the B flat, but we're putting in a B natural uh, accented on the downbeat of the last measure that then immediately resolves up to uh, the fifth, which is the C. Uh, and this is a Lydian uh, scale, a Lydian mode uh, relationship. Now, if you're in C major, you find the Lydian mode by starting on F. So in C major, if I start on F and I make F my tonic, my root uh, uh, bass note, which is something we talked about in the last tutorial is is creating more exotic har more exotic harmonies by starting from a different key uh, you would get a Lydian scale where there is a sharp four or a flat five uh, in there actually it's a sharp four in that instance uh, and that would lead then it would add an additional leading tone quality that goes up to the uh, five uh, so rather than the four going down to the three you have a sharp four that wants to lead up to the five and we're mixing these together uh, in this situation here I'm using a Lydian uh, sharp four at the very end to create additional tension and resolution very very popular uh, thing to do in film music now you'll notice as I isolate these sounds, the sounds don't sound exactly right uh, when I isolate them. Uh, but uh, with the articulations I'm using, when it all gets put together, things pop out and stick out uh, pretty well. It makes it sound uh, pretty authentic uh, to, to what we want. So anyway, that's that. We have uh, that Lydian uh, thing going on there in the horn part with that counter melody uh, that's using those uh, same uh, leading tone uh, uh, ideas but setting offsetting it by a beat. Let's take a look at the trumpet solo real quick. I'll uh, enable this. So I have a trumpet solo using some different tones that are a little bit more bright and this is a pretty high part. Now this is something you want to be careful of whenever you're writing uh, in a MIDI sequencer for uh, virtual orchestra. You don't want to make the instruments do things they really can't do. Now this is at the very upper edge of a trumpet. You, a trumpet can play up here and oftentimes in film music uh, there's much more of a commercial sound and you'll hear trumpets uh, uh, soaring up really pushing the upper edge of their um, 
that range. Now, I'm a trumpet player, so I can tell you that technically, theoretically, a trumpet has no upper range. It can go on and on and on as far as the uh, person can play. So this isn't uh, out of the realm of possibility, really, for an accomplished uh, trumpet player, but it is up there. It is pushing it. So let's listen to what this sounds like. And again, the way I came up with this... I just listened to it over and over again, uh, my original theme, and I started imagining these ideas in here, and I kind of played around. And I didn't really consider, honestly, I didn't consider what the chord values were. I just wrote the melody and the counter melody in uh, to sound the way I wanted it to. And if it had some accented passing notes or it had some non-chord tones, uh, if that sounded the way I wanted it, then I let it go. And uh, again, uh, music theory and analysis is something that people do to pieces that people compose. It's not something that a composer does to write. Uh, again, you only do it whenever you're preparing a, a piece to sound like a known genre or a known idiom, uh, which is not necessarily what we're doing here. We're writing new music. Uh, we do know that we're writing in a particular key and with particular kinds of sonorities that are very major sounding. Um, so we can avoid those really heavy dissonances, but there might be some dissonances in here uh, that don't fit the chord tones, and that's okay, or the chord movement, as long as it sounds interesting and it sounds good and it sounds pleasing. So if it sounds good to to me, it probably sounds good to other people too. Um, and I'm, I'm always thinking about the audience as I'm writing what I'm doing. Will this uh, sit well with the average listener? Will this sound uh, like something that is in their vocabulary? Or is it jarring? So I, I put this in here in a trumpet solo. I also put it in doubled in a trombone solo. So let me turn this on too. We can hear what it sounds like. So far, we just have the um, trumpet and the horn, counter melody. Now we have this solo. And you can hear that Lydian sharp four going to five there in the horn part at the very end. Uh, and if we put it all together, uh, we hear this on the second half with chromatics, uh, a chromatic descending bass line. Now, this bass line, again, does not follow the chord progression. So as we uh, start uh, forcing a new bass line on it, this descending uh, uh, stepwise and then chromatic bass line, uh, we just cut out some of the uh, harmonies and the arpeggiations underneath so that it can uh, stand out a little bit better without any conflict. Uh, so here's what we've got. And a lot of different sounds going on there. Uh, we've got some accented uh, uh, sounds down here in the tuba. This is actually a bass trombone, uh, solo bass trombone sound that, that makes a nice, really gravelly, gritty sound uh, for this, uh, as an additive sound to this tuba. Uh, so that is the uh, brass section. Let's take a look at the woodwind family very quickly. And the woodwind family actually isn't all that interesting. Um, they're just kind of doubling uh, some of the things that we see down in the strings in terms of this arpeggiation uh, or the bass line. Uh, so we already heard the oboe part. Let's take a look at this part over here. Uh, so we made sure to copy over our chromatic descending bass line into the bassoon so it matches everything else. Uh, the clarinet is doubling the counter melody. It's not very loud. I might actually turn that up a little bit. 
Uh, and then up here on the oboe, we have the same oboe melody coming back again. Uh, the flute, this one's really interesting. I needed something that would stick out a little bit better, and the flute that I had on top uh, didn't really have a clear articulation. It was a good sound, but the articulation wasn't that great. So uh, I found another flute articulation in my collection there that was a lot more aggressive, and I found when I put these together, if you listen... I found that they weren't very well in tune with each other, and I thought that was awesome. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that things won't be perfectly in tune in a real situation. So I put them together uh, just to see if it would help it stand out a little bit more, and it really did. It worked pretty well, particularly with the string parts. In fact, if I uh, enable all of these and we enable the string writing, which is more similar, particularly at that moment, you'll see how this all fits together. And uh, with that marcato writing down here in the strings, the flute part really stands out well, the oboe stands out well, the clarinet works well, and the bassoon doubles well. So uh, that's a, an example of not only family writing, but also doubling. We're doubling the two families, putting them together. They have a very similar function. Uh, so across families, similar parts are doubled uh, in a very conventional way. Uh, so anyway, that's the whole thing. Uh, let's take a listen one more time to it and see see if it makes a little bit more sense. Oh, we need to look at percussion. Let's do that very quickly. So in percussion, there's a few things going on down here. I have some snare drum parts. Uh, what I did is I have a snare and a tom drum. Uh, this is the snare drum part here. That's a snare drum sample that I made myself, and that's in the package that I shared on a previous tutorial, so you can find that. That's the tom drum from the same snare where the snare is off. I put them together, it gave me more of a field drum kind of sound. And that roll sounds pretty terrible when you hear it by itself, but in the context of everything else, it, it, it's pretty passable. Uh, so that's just a very simple snare drum part right at the very end. Uh, the cymbals are probably the more interesting thing. So let's uh, solo some of these cymbal parts down here. So in the orchestral percussion uh, section, I have cymbals. Two cymbals being played together, two crash or suspended cymbal kinds of sounds. Um, over here, I also have um, a bass drum two uh, bass drums that are half step apart being played together to give uh, some big crashes out there. Uh, then I have a gong. This is actually was created, I sampled this from a suspended cymbal that I repitched, uh, duplicated over and over again and kind of folded up on itself to create a gong sound. So this is not really a gong. It's actually a suspended cymbal, uh, one hit that is uh, duplicated, uh, repitched, and resampled. So I put a gong on there to get some lower frequencies, and then I needed to get a good cymbal roll. Now, uh, sound fonts are notorious for not being able to do cymbal rolls very well. If you were to use a cymbal sound, even a suspended cymbal sound, uh, and create a roll, like what I did for the snare drum part there, uh, you would hear almost every single articulation. It wouldn't work out very well. Uh, a real cymbal roll should have kind of a whooshing sound to it. So I've discovered the best thing to do, actually, is to just get a reverse cymbal from a general MIDI file. This is actually from the Fluid R3 general MIDI. Uh, and this is just the, the uh, reverse cymbal sound, which is more like a, an electronic digital sound. It's the sound of a cymbal being struck, recorded, and then reversed. So that's happening in, in, in reverse. And what I did is I layered these up such that we have low frequencies first. They build up to higher frequencies, and they all arrive at this uh, down uh, downbeat right here on the second measure. Uh, and it sort of implies a real cymbal roll. And if we put this together with an attack on other cymbal sounds, it works out pretty well. Now additionally, on this instrument track, I added a really over overly aggressive reverb, and that helps out quite a bit too. So this is what it sounds like. So if we put that together, with our other cymbal hits, we get something uh, that sounds like this. Yeah. 
So we have that gong in there too. Here over here, we'll hear it with the bass drum. So that's the cymbals. Uh, down here we have a timpani part, which is pretty straightforward too. It's just following the bass line with a couple of additional articulations. Now normally timpani would not have so many different note changes. Normally you would pick just uh, a few notes that are within a chord quality between your drums and then at some point in the piece the timpanist would retune. However, more advanced parts might get a little bit more diatonic and chromatic, particularly if uh, the uh, pedal uh, mechanism has an indicator for the uh, uh, different note values. It helps a person to tune a little bit more aggressively and I, uh, I put a, a little roll figure here on the end. Again, we uh, mixed up some of the note values, so there's some 30 seconds and there's 64ths and 16ths all mixed together to make it a little bit more human with a curve and the velocity uh, written in. So that's everything. Uh, those are all of the parts put together. Let's listen to this one more time and see if uh, it makes sense the way it's, it, uh, it fits together now with this explanation. So there it is. There's a sketch based on the theme that we wrote. Um, now I'll tell you that this took maybe an hour uh, to put this together um, and we really only had to write a few things. We wrote uh, a counter melody, a solo uh, part, and uh, an alternative bass line here at the very end. Uh, and then apart from that we made it modulate and we added a few little uh, few little accents here and some of these other parts in the percussion and the harp uh, part. So, um, you know, not a whole lot of different writing uh, was required in order to uh, flesh this out into an orchestration, something that uh, someone could, re you know, relate to. It sounds like something they've heard before, and that's the goal. Uh, so some final thoughts here. Uh, first of all, again, we're writing this uh, thematic material without seeing a film. So we have not, um, uh, we've not had the opportunity to sync this with anything happening in a picture, and that's okay. Uh, and I wanted to kind of explain this one point here. Hits. That is the moments in the film, those moments in the film where something is supposed to musically happen, these hits, these cues, aren't everything. Um, in fact, if all of your music that you write for a picture um, rely on hits, uh, that is, assigning something to happen musically at uh, specific moments constantly, you, you come up with something that we refer to as Mickey Mousing. Mickey Mousing, and and that is essentially what you get when you take uh, you know the cl classical music um, and you write or or create a an animation, a cartoon animation that matches all of the musical movements to that classical piece of music, and that's what you see in Mickey Mouse cartoons or the Warner Brothers cartoons, you know Bugs Bunny. Uh, so Mickey Mousing, that's when 
everything, every musical gesture that you hear is depicting something that's in the picture. We're not going for that. Now, hits are important. These cues, these moments, these hits where things happen and having a musical gesture, that can be very vital um, in, in syncing up your picture. And, and we'll talk about that later on, but that is not essential, uh, particularly with thematic music. Um, that thematic music does something more than just create a, a fully reliant narration of everything that you see. It can also provide a general emotional or situational context. So if you think about film music, what it's doing is it's giving you some context, emotional context, that's either related to what a character is feeling or thinking or what they're experiencing situationally. Uh, and it just relays that context to the audience member so that they can feel uh, the same thing in the same way in the same moment as the characters do or feel or experience a situation uh, in real time. Uh, so that's what thematic music is usually doing. It is giving some kind of emotional context that's not rooted in, in, in narrating every single hit that you see going on uh, in the picture. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're writing your thematic material. We don't have to worry about that right now. Uh, we're writing a thematic uh, uh, orchestration that we might be able to fit in somewhere. Now maybe none of this will work, we don't know, but it does help with the director if you're working with someone else. It helps them to understand if you're on the right track or the wrong track in terms of that uh, emotional situational context. Uh, so hopefully we can slap in this minute and a half of music into our animation somewhere and it will uh, work out and uh, be helpful. Um, the next thing too is that you want to be diverse in your orchestration but you should probably keep the roles the roles that each instrument and instrument family play uh, you want to keep those roles very few uh, and sparse and uh, you want to make sure that you are uh, uh, keeping kind of a, a thinner and clear orchestration so that you can hear all of the ideas stand out uh, you don't want to um, you don't want to pack in all kinds of different ideas and thick you know orchestration that is not easily understood because again we are trying to communicate to the audience in a language that they understand in a language that they already know and that they conceive of um, now there are times where you want to thicken things up and there are times when you want things to be very confusing and strange but that is usually because you're trying to convey something that is confusing and strange situationally context Textually, emotionally. Um, that's not the case here. We want this to be something that is easily relatable. So I recommend that you keep the roles of the instrumentation, the roles of the families, the roles of the different parts of the orchestration uh, very sparse very clearly set out uh, only you know three things happening at any one time and nothing more than that uh, so anyway those are some uh, recommendations that I have there and some final thoughts now where are we going in the future uh, going forward we're going to be looking at uh, timing uh, establishing mathematical timings to picture uh, and the creation of other um, modes of underscoring, that is creating um, ostinato patterns that repeat uh, some sound scape sounds using some um, synthesizers uh, and maybe some other instrumentation as well, some more traditional instrumentation, um, and creating an underscore to set the mood. Uh, and maybe we'll deal with uh, how you apply hits uh, that, that is musical gestures that are happening when things are happening in the picture when we get more into that uh, form of underscoring that's less thematic um, and we'll be using some of this theme some of these some of this motivic uh, material here in that underscoring as well as we go forward so uh, those are the things that we're going to be dealing with in the future uh, I, this is a bit bit of a longer tutorial but this is actually the hardest part of it really is using your thematic material and orchestrating that out. A lot of the other things that we're going to be doing from here on are going to be a lot simpler um, and a little bit more um, 
practical and conventional in terms of what a film score does and in, in terms of supplying just sort of a, a background uh, context, musical context. So uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, that is orchestrating a theme, fleshing out an idea. This is a very basic one. It'll probably change by the time we actually use it. We'll be tweaking it a little bit here and there and uh, adding, adding and taking away certain parts of what we've worked on. So anyway, uh, that's what I have for you today, uh, developing your theme and orchestrating it. Uh, using the MIDI data. So with this, I wish you the best of luck with these ideas and uh, happy mixing.